Uh, I understand some of you might have to pee, but we're going to get started on the Q&A. It's been, you guys have been here, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, writer-directors Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly. Thank you guys. Hello. Like I said outside, depending on how many people stayed, we'll determine how much they enjoyed the movie. That's a good sign. <laughs> good turnout. No, but it's true though. You guys have been here for a lot. A lot of you guys were here at five o'clock. Yep. You know what I mean? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Yeah. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Yeah. Four o'clock. Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Yeah. Do you want a Do you want a free water bottle? Or? <laughs> <laughs> you want it? Anyway. Uh, like, like I said before, any, anyone who's shooting video, please send to me. I would appreciate it. I want to, you know, do some stuff with it. But um, if you think I'm joking, I would. Some filters. <laughs> uh, so I want, I'm, we're going to talk, but because we're doing this like two weeks before it's going to be out, I would so appreciate, we're going to try to avoid some of the big spoilers in this to prevent anything from getting out and ruining some of the really big jokes. So, because um, I'm going to open it up to you guys at some point for questions, it would just be awesome if we avoid uh, maybe certain cameos, yeah. maybe. <laughs> you know what I mean. Just I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, congrats on the movie. Thank Thanks, you, man. How many people in here play D and D on an active basis? Oh wow, a lot of you. Okay. Okay, so the next question is for the people that raised their hands, uh, were you very happy, happy, wh how, where was it? Solid 10, ecstatic. Thank you so much. <laughs> so one of the things for you guys, uh, talk a little bit about the fact that one of the reasons I think this movie is so good is that it works if you don't know anything about D&D, &D, but if you do know about D&D, &D, there's so many things in this. So talk a little bit about um, the references or, you know, balancing, making sure it works for both audiences. Well, that was essential. You know, we went into it knowing that we couldn't just make a movie for fans, though we wanted to make sure the fans felt seen and that it represented all the knowledge they bring to it. Um, so it's, as you saw, there's a ton of Easter eggs, a lot of stuff from the lore, but we also didn't want it to be a requirement that you spend years learning the game to come enjoy the movie. And so that was the needle we were threading. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we set out to make a, a, a film that, that we were really proud of. Uh, we poured a lot of years of our lives into it. Um, knew that we had to kind of bridge that gap between fans and non-fans alike. Um, but I think what's so great about D&D &D is it's a welcoming game. And uh, if anyone's familiar with it, you know that you don't have to know a lot about D&D &D to come to love it. Uh, it's the spirit of the game that makes it special, and that's definitely what we wanted to emulate in this. So when you guys first started developing the idea of what you wanted to put on screen to what everyone watched tonight, how much changed along the way? Was it How radical of a change is it? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't terribly different, honestly. Uh, there was a time when Kira didn't exist. Um, and that was after a, a round of notes that we did, and then when we brought Chris back, um, it, it changed back cl closer to its original form. What's I was funny say. is he never read the first script that had Edgin having a daughter. We took it out for various reasons. He read it, he said, I feel like I should have a daughter. <laughs> and we're like, well, we've got that draft. <laughs> it's the easiest rewrite in the world. Uh, well, I, I love Hugh Grant. Uh, and he's great in this. Uh, I'm just curious, was he a tough sell? Talk a little bit about getting him in the movie. I think the, the title alone was the toughest sell for him. <laughs> and then when, fortunately when he read the script, he, uh, he came to love it. And remember the first Zoom that we had with him, you do his voice. He said, um, I should tell you, I hate everything I read and I loved your script. <laughs> And then he asked and then, us, and then he asked us which one of, he asked his agent, he said, which of them is British? Because he felt it had such a British tone, which is very flattering to us because, you know, we came of age obsessed with Monty Python, and that was such an influence on this. So I really, really dig the action in this and how well, it's very well staged. Can you sort of talk about working with your second unit, putting the sequences on screen? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the only good thing to come out of this horrible pandemic was it gave us more time to prepare this film before we started shooting it. And uh, one of those things was uh, animatics and previs and storyboards. And we really were able to uh, curate uh, the, the sequences in a way that we wouldn't normally have under uh, your general uh, production schedule. Uh, four years we've been working on this thing. Uh, over a year on the script and about two years of prep and shooting and then another year of post, which is kind of insane uh, considering, you know, generally that's with movies like Avatar where you see the, that schedule. But I think ultimately we're, we're so proud and, and grateful of the extra time that we had to refine it and make it what we wanted. And the other thing we did when we approached the action sequences was it's it's sort of a pet peeve of ours when um, it's all very close and uh, quick cuts and you can't really tell what's going on and so we made a decision to shoot it as wide as we could which requires more of the actors the stunt team because you have to really choreograph all those moves because you're going to actually see it play out we drew a lot of inspiration from jackie chan actually and and his films um, because you can you can see what he's doing, you can see the the expertise required to pull off some of those stunts, and that was our mandate with our stunt team, our Bulgarians, and they made it sexual but brutal. It's <laughs> <laughs> a callback. Right. I asked Jeremy and the cast, and I'll ask you guys. Everyone in this theater, almost everyone in the theater, knows how. The sausage is made when it comes to making movies and television. What do you think would surprise them to learn about the making of this film? Um, I, I got something in you. The, uh, the beat down at the end that you saw of uh, Sofina by the Albert was technically a reshoot. Um, when we panned off of uh, uh, Sofina, uh, it was originally. Um, Sophia's character, Doric, hitting her with just an owlbear arm. Uh, and she flew into a stand of provisions, and it was really unsatisfying. And we uh, ultimately decided that was one of those moments where we needed the catharsis of seeing her uh, get her ass kicked. <laughs> and so uh, in that whip pan, it was actually a cut. And we were able to bring back the owlbear um, with, with a lot of uh, extra, extra salary and we wooed it with salmon. She's tough. Her agent's really tough, that owlbear. Um, and just to add to that, I'm talking about movie magic. So when we did these reshoots, we shot in LA. Most of it was shot in Belfast, but the reshoots were done on the Paramount lot. And with blue screen and the technology we have now, we were able to blend into what we had already shot back in Belfast. And it's seamless. You can't tell what was here, what was there. We're generally allergic to overuse of blue screen, but this was one of those moments where we couldn't rebuild the back lot and we had these perfect tiles, is what they call it, where they basically take pictures of the set uh, that we had in Belfast and we were able to redo it. And if you look really closely, Chris's hair was totally different when we did the reshoots. Yes. We had to wig him, and so you can see that there's a little bit of wigging in the reshoot part. Uh, I think that uh, I learned that your where you shot, you took over the stages of Game of Thrones. That's right. Uh, and stage is a generous word for what those things are. They were paint halls used to build the Titanic and other ships, because that's what Belfast did for 100 years. And um, you know they were massively tall, but unheated, really rudimentary boxes that we shot in. And the back lot was King's Landing. But as you recall, if you've seen the show, King's Landing gets destroyed in the last episode. So. Uh, we oh, rebuilt it into land. Everwinter. Yeah, we got this totally demolished, shitty backlot with like fire burns you know, all over it. Uh, so I'm fascinated by the editing process because it's where it all comes together. So uh, let's talk. The first question is Did you have a much longer director's cut? How did you end up with the length that everyone watched tonight? Uh, well, when you first do a movie, you get an editor's assembly, so while you're shooting, the editor is simultaneously putting all of the scenes together, very roughly. Uh, and our, our amazing editor, Dan Leventhal, who's worked with our producer, uh, Jeremy Latcham, is sitting right there. Raise your hand, Jeremy. <laughs> By the way, Jeremy... 
really was incredibly helpful, and I and we owe so much of this film to him and his perseverance and dedication. He was very much the cheerleader and uh, his man he's, of all trades. He's not at all sexual or brutal. <laughs> <laughs> he can be brutal. Uh, but, but Jeremy uh, came up under uh, Marvel and had been with Marvel since Iron Man and so knows a thing or two about big budget movies and how to do them. Um, and so basically we had this editor's assembly that was over three hours and we cut it down to a director's cut that was about two and a half hours. And ultimately we got it down to a tight two hours and 11 or so minutes. You, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, I like knowing about deleted scenes. So did you have a lot of deleted scenes or did you sort of cut the fat out of the scenes you had? Mostly it was trimming down what we had. There were a couple scenes that made it to the floor, the cutting room. Um, there was a scene when they leave uh, the tavern in the very beginning um, and Holger gets kind of um, harangued by former members of, or members of her former tribe, other barbarians who, you know, call her names and stuff and she sadly says they're not wrong. Um, and it was an effort to kind of build more sympathy for her, but ultimately we felt like, let's get to the action. Um, that's always the tension in these kind of movies, is you know, you want to build in all the things you need, all the pieces you need, so that people feel for the characters, but you really want to get the story going. Uh, what was the last thing you took out of the film before you picture locked? Hmm. It was probably a year ago. Jeremy? Uh -huh. <laughs> I think the last thing we took out of the picture was a joke uh, outside of Barliament's house oh, where yeah. Edgin uh, said, or Simon says, so that's Marleman, and Doric says, I thought he'd be... Right. Uh, and then Simon says, he's quite tall for a half. Which <laughs> uh, <laughs> was a like, cute yeah. joke. Yeah. Like, you laughed. All right, we're going to put it back. Put it back yeah. Yeah. Thanks a Can lot. Can we postpone the release date? Thanks a lot, audience. Um, <laughs> And then aside from that, very small surgical trims that if I told you what they were, you'd be asleep by the end of it. <laughs> Directors who we like gave us this bit of advice early in our career, which we really took to heart, which is it's always better to kill your B material to make your A material sing even more. And so there's stuff that we love and we keep in right up until we're getting close to locking and we're like, all right, let's let that go because pacing is everything. Uh I'm, I really loved the reincarnating the dead. Uh, so who wants to take some props for coming up with that idea? Well, that was probably the only vestige of the original draft that we ended up rewriting, um, that conceit. Uh, granted, it was only one or two corpses that they bring back to life, but we thought it was such a fun idea and way to kind of structurally tell the story of these flashbacks. And so we, we uh, in industry terms, we blew it out, meaning we, we had a lot more corpses, a lot more deaths, <laughs> and that allowed us to have, you know, the guy falling in the, the tub and all of those fun beats. Our original idea was to have the Monty Python guys voice those corpses, but for a number of reasons it didn't come to pass. Most of those reasons are money. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are dead. <laughs> I know it's true, but... <laughs> Uh, what is the name? I, I messed it up today when I was doing some interviews. What's the name of the big red dragon? Embershot. Yeah, I, I called him Chunky or something like that <laughs> on the camera. I fuck because I think one of you posted a thing. I said Chunky. That's what Chunky, which is what the kids are saying apparently. But Embershot <laughs> actually exists in the lore, and he was this gluttonous dragon. I see some heads nodding. <laughs> You're a geek. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, what's so great about D&D is that there's so many characters, so many creatures that exist that you can pull exactly what you need from. Um, and it helped to kind of craft a story that felt authentic to, to the story. Was there a creature or character that you really wanted to put in this movie but just couldn't find a way to fit it? <laughs> Well, interestingly, so the, the Jonathan bit at the beginning, our first idea for it was that it was going to be an ooze. Um, <laughs> a half ooze. Which doesn't exist. Which isn't a thing. So we were trying to figure out, okay, what if a member of this Absolution Council was a partial ooze character, and he would come in the door, and they would grab him, and he would, they'd tie it, part of him to a table leg, and Bungie jump out jump the window, down, so, you know, <laughs> and he would stretch. But ultimately, the, the people at Watsy told us that's not a thing. <laughs> 
It would probably would have been too silly to uh, the first five minutes of the film. Uh, what was the thing? I'm sure there was some battles behind the scenes. What was something that you had to fight for to keep in the movie? Do we say it? Yes. Uh, Zank jumping over the rock was a big. That was the thing. Who we fought with? There was there was a certain concern on the part of certain studios, and certain movies. <laughs> That if there's too many jokes, tell me if you agree with this. If there's too many jokes in a movie, it hurts the stakes, and the audience checks out and doesn't care about you know what's happening. Not That's not true. a thing, right? Not true. You can hold two things in your head at the same time, right? Yeah, if they're good jokes. So anyway, so that was one where they felt like, no, he should just exit. We're gonna get fired. <laughs> Can't fire us now. <laughs> uh, that said, uh, we were we were incredibly supported by both studios, E1 and Paramount, throughout this whole endeavor, who really allowed us to make the film that we wanted to make. So props to them. First of all, that, that, that was brilliant. And second of all, I'm going to give a huge thank you to Paramount for letting us do this tonight. By the way, before, we're still going, but before I forget, if you did enjoy this movie, uh, please use this thing called social media and mention it. Just throwing that out there. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 101 so, stars. Wow. Out of how many? 101 stars. Out of, out of, out of 101. <laughs> so, being serious, you did make this with Paramount, Wizards of the Coast, E1. There was a lot of people that you had to please and, and to make your movie. Can you sort of talk about what it's like behind the scenes trying to make everyone happy while also trying to make a movie? Uh, it was a bit of a headache, but I will say this. Again, uh, thank you to Paramount E1. <laughs> Look, I mean, what, what you saw there was very much our vision, and it's a big swing. And so we give them all the credit in the world for allowing us to use practical effects, which, by the way, studios don't usually want that. And they, they let us do it, and that, I think, really helped to differentiate us from a lot of the big-budget fare that you see in theaters nowadays, uh, as well as this incredibly unique and bizarre tone that we were allowed to do. <laughs> They let us do jokes that cost like a million dollars. The intellective hour joke. joke, where it's like, that's a little hurtful. Like, that's an expensive joke. <laughs> One of the things, though, that I think the film does so well is it balances the fun with the funny and with the action. And that's a really difficult tone to hit and make it all work. So talk a little bit about finding that in the editing room. Was it all in the script? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I, w I would say that one of the things that allowed us to do that was the glue that kind of fused all those things together was heart. Uh, we approached this very earnestly. Uh, we were not cynical about this. Um, we, we care deeply about the material and the world that we're trying to show people who aren't necessarily familiar with it. And if you care and are invested in your characters, you can get away with a lot. And uh, that's kind of what we did. So you obviously did friends and family screenings or test screenings or both. Uh, what did you learn from those screenings that uh, impacted the finished film? Uh, the first thing we learned was there was confusion about what the villains were up to. Um, and so all the, um, the flashbacks where you see what Zastam did in, you know, back in the day with the beckoning death, that was a reshoot material. Um, because, it, you know, obviously it, there's a lot going on um, with what Sophina's up to, what's that got to do with Forge and all that. And so we didn't want the audience to get caught up in trying to follow that and be confused. So that was a way of just sort of spelling it out in a clear way that was fun visually too. And it also allowed us to kind of amplify the threat of the baddies. We didn't want to ever undermine uh, what the overarching threat of the, the bigger baddies in, this, in the movie were doing. So oh, there was also something we changed, which was interesting about at, at the end when they're on the boat and um, they make that decision to go back and help Neverwinter. We had written it so that it takes Edgen longer to make that turn. Um, where he, he does something about like, a lot um, up until he says, yeah, well, well, shit. So it was kind of like, he said something like, oh, what a shame. And then, they and then Kira's like, like, well, aren't we going to go back? He's like, no, 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 I'm sure there are plenty of other heroic types. More heroic types. You can you can have have a, but it was ultimately kind of a bummer, and we could see that we were losing the audience with that. So uh, we decided to be a little more concise with his decision 
make him a little more heroic in that moment. Uh, I'm about to open it up to questions, but I just want to ask one more. So start thinking about things you might want to ask. Uh, I love dragon sequences in TV and movies, and you have a great one in this with, I'm going to use Chonky. Uh, so talk a little bit about the challenge of creating your own dragon sequence and how much time and energy you put into it. Well, the way we approach action sequences is always kind of the way we approach comedy sequences, which is what can we do that's not been seen before? How do we make this fresh? You've certainly seen people run from dragons and lots of things. So we thought, um, all right, so what is gonna make this different? And the first beat was it flopping down like a penguin, you know, and then sliding after them. We watched a lot of reference videos of animals uh, for this, including walruses, massive dachshunds. Uh, we, gave our, we gave our VFX vendors um, a video of uh, a very fat um, dog on its, caught on its back trying to flip over and it's using its spine to flip itself over, which was partly what inspired the, what we called the Jurassic Park shot. Um, but you call it, yeah, there's a, there are a few homages to Jurassic Park, including the very beginning when Gorg the Hobgoblin is being carted in. I mean, that's a love letter to my favorite filmmaker Spielberg, who truly inspired me to, to, to make movies. Um, and so we Steven, have to pay homage. Are you here tonight? Stand up. <laughs> I said he was coming. It's awkward. It's a little hurtful. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of moving parts. We had um, an amazing storyboard artist, David Krentz, who helped work with us on that, who worked on multiple Marvel scenes with, uh, with Jeremy. And basically, we knew we wanted to uh, chew up the scenery. We had these, um, these incredible big platforms suspended by chains, and we thought it would be fun to disrupt those. And we basically took advantage of every inch of the, the, the setting that we had. Um, I'm curious, I see a hand right there. Uh, thanks for putting the TV, C, uh, TV series character in the movie. <laughs> that was awesome. You're welcome. Uh, did they die or did they die? No, stay? come on. Okay. <laughs> they were directly not allowed to die. They, literally. We, we like to allude to the fact that they might die, but we, we kept it open. -ended. There's a, a deleted scene where they die horribly. <laughs> We should actually point out that who here has seen the cartoon and understands the reference, and who sort of needs to be ex had to explain. Man. It was it was news to me. I, I, I guess I'm at the age where just well, I'd never noticed it. We but. should also say where the scene is in the movie, so for people that yeah, don't in the arena, you see these uh, oddly clad figures. There's two teams with them, and they're off to the left. The and, people uh, wearing the most absurd outfits <laughs> were the uh, they're from a cartoon. That's why we didn't show them very well. well and what we learned, because we went to Brazil for their Comic-Con in Sao Paulo, and they love that series down there. I mean, people went crazy for it, and England, too. As well as in the UK, I remember all of our crew were so delighted to, to see those 80s characters. Uh, yeah, when you watch the movie again, uh, you'll notice it, if you didn't know what it was. Hold on, I'm making... So, uh, as a player who has actually used Neo Cobra unwillingly to jump off the cliff really? and take myself, uh -huh. yeah, I felt so we didn't steal it from her. You we did not it? steal it from you. There's no way we could have known that. <laughs> By the way, um, I wanted to ask, because high fantasy movies are really hard to sell, I think especially now in our, our modern kind of situation, how hard was this a pitch to actually get off the ground, and how long did that take? I mean, the movie had been kicking around for uh, over a decade, yeah, long to be, before uh, we became Warner involved. Brothers. It was, yeah. I think the thing that was difficult was nailing down the tone. And when we approached it, we knew we wanted there to be comedic elements. I know that can piss off some people because they treat uh, high fantasy as nothing but solemn and serious, but we think that there's room for every subgenre in every genre. And so we definitely leaned into that element. Yes. Right here. Um, you talked about how you were able to get new grand on board. You have amazing cast top to bottom. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to put together uh, this team? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've always been fortunate enough to, to do is to, you know, your script is a sales tool in many ways, because the movie's not going to get made if you don't get a cast that can get it greenlit. And so we try to write the script in a way that actors are going to read it and be, all right, this is it's intriguing to them. Um, 
And part of that is giving every character something to do, some an arc, and we really tried to do that here. So everybody saw an opportunity to do some fun acting in it. Um, Chris, you know, was it was a process. I mean, he read it. We talked several times. We talked about what it could be, and then and then he, he signed on, um, and then other people followed. We had a lot of uh, actors and actresses in mind as we were developing it. Um, we were huge fans of Justice Smith, and so he was. Uh, one of our first pitches for Simon. Uh, and we didn't even know if he could pull off the accent, but what was really gratifying was uh, Hugh actually thought he was British when, when he did the episode, <laughs> which was great. And Reggie was sort of a no-brainer, you know, just like, we love the idea of out hotting Chris. You know? <laughs> and when we cast Reggie, he didn't quite know his work or anything. We showed him a picture of Reggie, and Chris was like, come on. <laughs> Uh, I want to go towards the back since we've been, oh wow. Um, I'm going to go to that back corner right there. Uh, so in terms of like the practical effects of the studios being kind of resistant to them, is that a just like pure budget dollar amount? Is that the time that it can add to do it well? Is it liability? Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Like what's the opposition and how do you overcome it? It requires a lot more prep. Um, and I think some studios, not this one because they were for it from the beginning, but some studios uh, resist it because it requires you to uh, have that aesthetic set in stone. Whereas if you're doing an entirely CG character, you can change it and change it and change it and change it. Um, and so we had the, the, the confidence from the studio to, to, to go for it. And, you know, I think there's an attitude among some studios that if you do a practical effect, you're just going to end up replacing it with a digital one. And that happens a lot, by the way, but we didn't do that here. Uh, right there, yes. Um, when and how did you get the idea for the movie? Good question. Well, uh, well, there was a script that had been floating around before we became involved. Uh, granted, we, we changed a, a good amount of it. Um, but the thing that was really alluring to us was the idea of it being a heist. We thought that that was a really relatable uh, genre to kind of explore in the fantasy space that we don't usually see, and also feels very D and D. Um, and so we kind of went from there. We we pitched our take. One of the earliest sequences that we pitched was the the Doric chase, that that wonder that we have with our wild shaped druid, um, because we thought it would be a really immersive thing. And also we love doing wonders. We did it in game night with the Fabergé egg. And, uh, and so that was one of the many kind of sequences that we were pitching with the, with the sort of general idea of the story surrounding it. You know, it really was a, a reflection of the spirit of playing the game. You know, that's what we wanted to get across. Without rolling dice, without doing a Jumanji thing, just to kind of feel what it's like when you're playing D&D. That um, you never know what's going to happen. You make mistakes, you roll badly, things go wrong, and you have to figure out what you're going to do next. And that's what we try to capture in the movie. By the way, for the, everyone in the audience, if you haven't seen Game Night, for the love of God, yeah. watch this game. Thank you. It's real good. Um, all right, let's go into the middle. I'm, actually, I see a hand right there. Let's do that one. So speaking of playing D&D, &D, did you do it at all during production? We did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we did. Well, not, not during. Once we got going, there's no time for anything. But when the cast first arrived in Belfast, we did a four-hour game with them. Um, we had a dungeon master from Seattle on the Zoom. And uh, it was really helpful, actually, almost as helpful as rehearsing, because they played as their characters. We got to see them in motion. They got to feel what it is to play. And it informs some of the things that went in the movie. Uh, right here. Can you back me on a little bit? First, I, as someone who saw the old movie in the 90s, I remember the Did everyone hear that question? Yeah. Right, cool. Just making sure. Uh, I would I would say reggae because he is uh, secretly very geeky, <laughs> and I think he would uh, he would do his homework. He played a lot of RPGs, uh, not necessarily uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but I think he has a real sense for that type of storytelling. And then behind him, definitely Chris, who is a, 
a director and incredible storyteller himself. Uh, back there. Um, I noticed in the credits someone credited as lore master. <laughs> Is that a typical role in production? <laughs> yes, every movie has that. <laughs> Um, no, uh, we, in our efforts to be true to the game, we had someone on set though who, it's like a, like when you're doing a medical show, you know, and you need to know like what the surgery is, we would have someone whisper in our ear like, she can't do that spell. <laughs> There's a somatic component to that spell. If we were really true to the game, they would have had to rest between spells, and that's not the greatest thing to watch. <laughs> So you, you're trying to say you took liberties with Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> <laughs> that was cool, man. Listen, that's not cool. That is not cool. Um, wait, did I see anybody or am I gonna... Sorry. I guess we'll go right here. So I would love to know, first of all, I love all your guys' stuff. Like, you. amazing. And, yes, you gave um, One of the things that I wanted to know is, what was the most challenging scene that you guys had to do? And then the Two scenes come to mind that were the most challenging. One was that portal heist of getting the painting into the wagon, and the other was the Dora Wonder, where she's changing from animal to animal. Um, both took many days to shoot. They were done in many different locations. Some of it was on set, some of it was out in the world. Um, even just the piece where, uh, where Sophia Lillis comes out of that little cabin and puts the hood over horns, it turns out it's really hard to put a hood over your horns, and that took about 25 takes just to get, and when you think about the sheer amount of extras in that scene, and the resets that we had to do, it became a little not mind-numbing by the end of that, um, and I would say that one of the most fun scenes was anything between Chris and Reggae, they had such a fun dynamic, and Reggae inhabited that role so naturally. Um, that it was some of the uh, some of the most fun that we had just laughing behind the monitors. Yeah, the walking away that became the walking away, the rock joke. We had a hundred alts for that. We had a whole thing where Chris is like, "Where's he even going? Is there anything? Is there anything in that direction? I think it's a, I think it's a dead end." Uh, I'm actually curious with the wonder, what is it like when you decide you want to do one of those? And like Jeremy is the producer, um, or do you have to go to Jeremy and sort of say, I think we should do this in a, as a one -er, and what's this going to cost? Like, how does that get figured out? Well, uh, like we said earlier, it was it was literally one of the first sequences that we even pitched to the studio, and I think it was part of what, what got us the job because um, it, it's, it's an inherently immersive experience, and anytime you're being pursued in that sense, it makes it all the more fraught and scary as an audience member. Um, but a lot went into it. It was, you know, we probably regretted it many times over the course of the uh, the shooting of it because you know, there was never any moment where it was entirely digital. You know, we we shot tons of plates, we shot tons of uh, real material uh, that we ended up, you know, putting our, our MPC, which is the VFX vendor, uh, animals in it. Um, and then kept redoing it and redoing it and redoing it. Um, and it was also a lot of second unit that we had to do for, for some of that uh, because we were shooting first unit simultaneously. But uh, they did an amazing job, I think, of just being able to fuse it all together. There's still some effects that we are like, ah, but that's just inherent in filmmaking. But um, I am curious though, what does the Wonder do to the, is it something that you look at in terms of costs and what will it cost to do this versus not doing this? Not really, we didn't approach it that way. I mean, like everything in this movie is expensive. Um, we approach it from what's going to be the freshest, most fun way to, to pick this bit of action. And that just lent itself to a Wonder. Yeah, and it, it, you know, the question is, is it worth it? And um, to us, it, it was. Oh, it, it's a great shot. By the way, d does everyone know what a Wonder is or should we sort of ex could you explain? For some of us are yeah. stupid. Sure. A wonder is basically a, a one-shot uh, take, mm -hmm. if you will. So rather than cutting into a sequence, um, you're at least giving the illusion that it's all happening without any cuts. Nice. Usually Good. nowadays it's actually multiple takes divided up and blended. But we didn't do that. We did it all as <laughs> cuts. It's all one. Anyway. It's all one. And those animals were all real. <laughs> right there. Was 
Uh, in a campaign that I was playing right before we actually, I had to stop it to, to do the film, um, there was one moment where our party was stuck on a platform over a bottomless pit with uh, cables kind of connecting it to the wall. And that's what ultimately led to the idea of that uh, dungeon in the Underdark being suspended by giant chains. And it was, it was just an attempt to kind of make it a little more unique and also be able to make it go to hell when, uh, when uh, Dembershad rolls onto it. Uh, so we're nearing what we call the end of this, and I just want to make sure. Uh, let me give this industry talk. What the end is? <laughs> Let's clarify that. Right. I would say that I've been given the signal from a studio that the Q and A will be ending very soon. <laughs> so what I like to do at the end, in case there's anybody who had some questions, I like to do this thing called rapid round or rapid fire, and we try to do these things. So in case there's any last questions, we can get those in, but we're going to do it really fast. It's just a cheeky question. We mentioned that Jeremy came from Marvel. Um, Great owl, like you see this. Was that the Loki Hulk? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right there. Favorite class to play as? Bard. Yeah. Paladin. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, right there. What age were you when you felt like your career was really kicking off? 14 years old when I got Freaks and Geeks. took this long. You guys have seen Freaks and Geeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. This show's okay. You know, uh, is there anything else? Or are we going to call it? Hold on, I want to make sure I see every... Wait, I do see a hand. Yes? Um, I noticed you were credited as the songwriters for the songs. How hard was that? Have you ever done that before? Uh, we love writing song lyrics. Um, we can't take credit for the, the music part of it, but um, yeah, have we done that? We did that in another... Thing, right? We did it in yeah, we did it in a, another movie, but it was it's one of our favorite things to do. We love to rhyme. That's We're good. rappers. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, here we go. Did you guys ever consider at the end of the film cutting to an actual campaign that went over all the events of the movie? I feel like if we did that, we would have undermined all of the stakes that we set up <laughs> up to that moment. And but it was definitely something that we talked about, and then we saw Jumanji. <laughs> uh, in the back. Portal 1, inspired by Portal Gun? Look, it's one of my favorite games. Um, in fact, I'm still I'm replaying it now. Um, kind of, but you know, the color's different, so no. <laughs> uh, right there. Uh, was the setting always going to be the Gun Realm, so did you look at how the D&D campaign settings? We were always circling it, and we always loved the idea of doing it on the Sword Coast because it has so many diverse locations, and it's what people are most familiar with. Uh, we're almost at the end. Here we go. The animated D&D characters. I noticed they're a little older than they are in the cartoon. Usually they <laughs> stuck there for a long time. <laughs> well, we couldn't. We couldn't. Really, it was practically difficult to have a real kid play that Bobby the Barbarian. It also <laughs> felt on the short, muscly man. <laughs> it also felt cool to imply that we were about to kill a bunch of children. <laughs> People frown on that. <laughs> um, on that note, I'm going to say real fast, like I said at the beginning, if you enjoyed this movie, please use whatever social media you're on and mention it. Uh, and I believe there are screenings on Sunday around the country. Wait, when is it? <laughs> it's this Sunday? 19th. The 19th? 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. They're showing it at like a thousand theaters around the country. Yeah, if you have Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, which I think a lot of people do. I heard rumors. On that note, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>